Okay. Sounds like it's time for us to start. So. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this talk. I'm Igor Bolotin, and I'm Chief Architect of Symantec OpenStack Cloud. Together with me today, Richard Bush. Hello, uh, I'm Richard. I'm a Technical Director at Symantec. Um, I previously was at Google doing um, image, uh, product image work, and so I've now joined Symantec and uh, doing something similar, although something a little different. Let's start. So let's talk about a little bit about environment in which we find ourselves. Just like many companies, when they move in, enterprise companies, when they move into cloud the first time, you find that you start with a lot of existing applications that run on a variety of uh, environments, mostly bare metal, some virtualized, variety of operating systems, uh, some new, some old, quite frequently very old. You find different Linux flavors, you find different Windows versions, and then the company starts to move into the cloud. Why to start to move into the cloud? Well, I'm not going to talk about why cloud here. That we all know why. The first kind of baby step, people move into cloud virtual machines. Maybe not rewriting applications yet. Maybe just moving into the cloud. Because it's easy to get VM on the cloud. And by the way, you can also consume some cloud, cloud platform services. And we provide these services. It's just the first step. The long-term vision, well, we're not going to talk about long-term vision here either. But the very first step you find when you go into the cloud, the first question you ask, so who is responsible? Who is responsible for all of this managing of different operating systems, different uh, images that you got on your cloud? Oh, well, if you go to public cloud, the responsibilities are very clear there. Well, cloud provider is responsible for the provider images, and that's all. Everything else is responsibility of tenants, of users of the public cloud. When we go into private cloud, that responsibility is not that clear. Why it's not clear? Because, first of all, we're at the same company. And the responsibility for providing security for our cloud is shared responsibility. Everyone is responsible. Both cloud team and users of the cloud. We do need to provide custom images. Well, it's not enough to provide just, build just provider images and be done. We need custom images for efficient operation. Can't really go and install hundreds of packages every time that I need to build a new virtual machine. So I build images that are customized for this specific project. But then it's a huge overhead for everyone to maintain these images. Can you hear me actually? Yeah, okay, good. Now when new vulnerabilities are discovered, and they're discovered very frequently, like just a couple of weeks ago, another vulnerability is discovered and another vulnerability need to be fixed. And now everyone is scrambling. Everyone is going and trying to patch VMs and trying to patch images. We have different needs in different areas of our cloud. In development, we need something that we cannot allow people to use in production sometimes. And all of that brings to the point that uh, the responsibility is really shared. And all of these tools and processes, all of these governance need to be provided as a service to our users. If we don't provide it as a service, it means that the user need to, uh, users need to do it by themselves. Not, a, not the best thing in the private cloud. Now we go and try to figure out the governance model. And there are a couple of extremes that we can go into. We can go and not to do that much of a governance. The governance could be a little bit relaxed. And that's what typically happens when 
the cloud team is really focused on building developer cloud first. Cloud for developers, cloud for the new applications to be built. Not a lot of attention paid to security and governance of that environment. But there are risks associated with it. Everyone goes and uh, starts building their own images. Every developer has uh, preferred operating system to work with. And yes, I need that specific version of the operating system. So uh, you start to see hundreds of different images doing different things. There is no established process for patching, for scanning. And very frequently, developer VMs are just not scanned and not patched. The worst thing well, that happens, you put these applications on, and now you have publicly accessible systems that are just vulnerable to very basic threats. You get all of the agility, not that much of security. You can go to the other extreme and been there, done that. The picture is not pretty when you go too far on the governance. You get, and by the way, that's what you get when you focus on your production first. You get a lot of attention to security. You get really hardened systems. You have very few images that everyone is, uh, that only those images are, uh, users are allowed to use. No custom images. You don't get any uh, root or pseudo access on that uh, VM that you created. You run some very strict configuration management tools. And by the way, they overwrite everything you do that is not authorized on the VM, which makes it extremely difficult to develop in that environment because it's too hardened. It's too difficult. It's impossible to work with. You get security but you lose agility on that. So how do we build system that would be not falling into the too lax or too strict? How do we build system that is balanced, that can help us achieve agility with security? That's the question. And that's the uh, approach that we're trying to take here at Symantec, with Symantec Cloud. The components that we are trying to address for the governance of private images, sorry, for images in the private cloud, these are components. It's about defining clearly for different types of images who is responsible, who owns that image, and who is responsible for maintaining this image. It's defining very clearly who can and cannot do what needs to be done with these images. Upload download, add, delete, make it public. Need to define that extremely carefully. Capacity management. Well, cloud is there, but does it have capacity for storing everything that everyone puts in? There, is, there are different approaches for building images. And there are approaches that you can do it ad hoc. You create an image, you snapshot it, make it available. You need to make some changes, you make the changes and make it available. Or you can build it in the right way. And we'll talk about what the right way is. Vulnerability and patch management, configuration management. These aspects need to be addressed in order to make it secure and at the same time give people ability to work with your environment. So let's start with the different types of images. What types of images we're talking about? Let's start with the public images. Every cloud has provider images. One thing is very clear. The provider images, the public images are only the images that we provide. As a semantic cloud, we build these images, we make it available to everyone in the cloud, and the only images that you see as, a pub, as public image is images that we provide. Those are official images. You, everyone can use them. These images are hardened. These images are scanned. So they are uh, secure. And we provide them to everyone to use. 
These are base images. There are also platform images, images that we use in order to build our platform services. And people are more than welcome to use them. They are a little bit different in what is in, in that image. Richard will talk about this a bit later. And Richard will also talk about how we build and how to internally open source uh, these images. Now, when we're talking about our public images, naming convention is very kind of basic thing. But we found very interestingly that our users were the first one to point to us that the naming convention that we picked at the beginning was not the most convenient one for them. At the beginning, we gave them images and we put the version, or actually the date, in the image name. We said, here, you know exactly when that image was built and uh, whenever we publish the new image, we will give you image with the new name and you can switch. And they're like, no, we don't want to do that. Because that means that every time you publish new image, now we need to go and change our scripts and uh, our integrations. We need to go and chase what is, figure out what is the latest image available. And yes, we need to use your latest image because that's the one that uh, is uh, the most secure one. So we change that. Now our images are, have very simple name. It's just the name and the major version. So you, you have base Ubuntu 14.04 or base CentOS 7. You don't have all of this complexity of the name and people can rely on that. On the other hand, we do store information about when the image was built and uh, uh, what happened with that image in the properties. Everyone can go and look at what's in that image, but it's no longer in the name. What it actually means also, that whenever we roll out new image, we need to replace the previous one, essentially. We no longer keep multiple copies, not multiple versions of public images in our cloud. We keep one, and it's the latest one. The previous one needs to be archived. What does it mean, archived? Well, today what it means, we essentially take the public bit off. It becomes a private. We don't delete images. When you delete images, that causes other problems. We keep all of the images that we created and we keep them at least until all of the VMs that were created with these images disappear. Well, terminated. Once all of the VMs gone, then we can go and delete the image. And that's the cleanup process that needs to happen. Because again, at the end of the day, you don't want to have uh, hundreds and hundreds of images in your cloud, even if they are private images, it's still overhead. Now let's talk about private images. Because we do have private images in the cloud. Everyone is allowed, everyone can create private image. And people can share these private images with the rest of the company. Well, not exactly with the rest of the company, because the default sharing that we have in OpenStack is a direct share with some other tenant. You want to share your image, you go and tell exactly whom you want to share it with. That's the shared images. Oh, here's the new capability that is coming. It's a community shared images. It's the images that you can actually advertise to the community. You can say, hey, I created this image. This is great image which has some really cool features that my cloud team didn't provide for me, but I can provide it to the rest of uh, the teams in the organization. The community sharing uh, work actually coming in Liberty, it didn't make it to Kilo. We do have it in our cloud, uh, in, uh, development was completed on that, but that's a different conversation. Uh, so this is coming in the next release, actually. Uh, community visibility. It, it's, uh, you can go and read the uh, blueprint. It's uh, actually very uh, well thought through blueprint. It gives the capability that we really, really need. The important thing is, though, even though these images are shared with the rest of the uh, cloud, they are very explicitly not maintained by cloud, by semantic cloud team. 
So when something happens in that, with that image, it's the responsibility of either the user to figure out what's wrong or responsibility of the image owner to help that user to, fi uh, to fix the problem. Now, if they come to us and ask for help, we will help, but we might need to ask them to reproduce that problem on the official image because, well, not always we can help with somebody else's image. Now, that also creates very different responsibility for, uh, for patching. Now it's no longer responsibility of the cloud provider to patch the images when something, uh, when the new vulnerability comes out. It's now responsibility of the image owner to remediate. And we define, uh, but we, what we do, we define the SLA for remediation. If it's critical vulnerability, the SLA will be very clear how fast that image needs to be fixed. And if it's not fixed within a defined SLA, it will be disabled. Well, negotiable sometimes. We know that sometimes the images cannot be just disabled because that can cause bigger problems. But generally understood that it's owner responsibility to fix it. Now, who can create images? Well, if it's developer cloud, if it's developer class of service in your cloud, everyone can build and upload images to their own projects. And they can use this image and they can share this image with other tenants as the developers. But when we come to production, you need to have explicit role in production to be able to share images, to actually just start from uploading the image and sharing the image in production. Because not everyone should be allowed to do this. And moreover, if you are Trying to make image public, well, we don't allow people to make image public. That's the whole point. The only people who are allowed to make image public are cloud image administrators. That's you, by the way, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Just to be clear. Let's talk a bit about capacity management. Cloud is big, right? We all know that uh, it's uh, infinite capacity. Well, it's illusion of infinite capacity. Because in reality, it's always finite capacity. We only have so much space. We only have so much compute to run our workloads on. And that means that if we give everyone capability to build and upload and create images and create snapshots and uh, store them, that can grow really fast. And we need to be able to manage that. How do we do it? Well, just like we define quota for number of uh, VMs and number of cores and uh, amount of RAM consumed, we also define quota for the storage can be, that can be used for images and for snapshots. But what was also very interesting what we found was that uh, defining quota is uh, actually, uh, it, it does help. But what helps even more is defining expiration. So rather than just blindly applying the quota, you can actually say that when you create that snapshot, it automatically expires after some time. And then it will be archived, cleaned, removed from the environment. Works really great with VMs, works really great with uh, snapshots. And yes, of course, you have to give people ability to go back and mark that one, don't expire that one. I really need that. I know that I'm not supposed to necessarily have this don't ever expire, but at the same time, I have some VM here that uh, uh, provide some critical service. I really, really don't want that to expire automatically. Same goes with snapshots. Well, I build that service, and I'm not, I, I have that snapshot as a backup. I want that not to expire automatically. Have the capability. Also defining different policies. How you clean up. Do you, do you want to clean up when you run out of space, when you run out of uh, time? Maybe both. What are the priorities? Which, which images or which snapshots need to be deleted first? That requires a little bit more 
uh, choice. And we do provide choice to our customers. We don't just lock them into one way of doing things. You have choice. You can select whether you want to automatically delete when it uh, expires or you want to let it run a little bit more if you have space. The important thing is that after a while it's still going to be deleted. And we reclaim the space that we need for other customers, other tenants. Well, another little tidbit on the capacity. People join the company, people leave the company. People leave the company constantly. And what you find, you find that you have terminated accounts and you need to figure out what to do with the resources that were owned by these people. That includes VMs, that includes uh, networks, that includes images. Now, why it's important to address that explicitly? Well, if the guy was created an image and shared it with the community, and now it's available for everyone to use, and he just left the company, who is responsible now for fixing that image if something goes wrong, or if there is new vulnerability that needs to be addressed on that image? So the approach is very simple. Either somebody needs to take over that resource, or it needs to be taken down, removed. You can't have resources in the environment, images, uh, VMs, uh, anything, that ownership is not clear. There could be an organized way of moving the owners, uh, to change the ownership, where the guy before he leaves, he can transfer the ownership to someone else. Or there might be a way when the guy already left. Oh, well, sometimes termination can be very quick. And then somebody else needs to take over that account uh, after the guy already left. So the notification will go out. Notification will go out to the guy, the, 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 or the girl, doesn't matter. Uh, it, it will go to the manager, to the project owner, in which that image resides, and to VM owners who depend on that image. Now, if it's unclaimed after a grace period, remove it. Don't leave it. Because that's, a, that's, a, that's actually a risk. It's not only just using the capacity. There is a security risk associated with uh, uncontrolled or resources that are not owned by anyone in the company. Let me transfer it to you for Thank you. how you do it. Yes. Um, so we want to set up um, a continuous integration, continuous deployment system uh, for our images. Um, we want to have uh, the image, um, the, the templates um, stored in Git as well as um, sort of files, unique files that might be in the image, uh, the list of packages, all those details. Um, as well as like the, the instructions essentially of how to, how to build the image, all stored in Git, uh, all put under a, a review system like Garrett, and then image is actually built by a service account, not by the, the user themselves, the usual user interface to say, look, build me this image, um, and then the system goes and pulls it out of uh, Git, builds the image, and then actually out, uploads it to Glance. Um, this way you can be assured that um, there's whatever images are there are uh, guaranteed to have come from checked in source code. So there's no like, well, what actually went into this image? Uh, and then also, once you have that technology, you can actually put in all kinds of metadata with the image saying, well, look, this is the, the change list number or the, 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 the branch that it came from, the time, and any other details that might be interesting at some point down the track. Um, so you, you can then also set up an automated build system where every night you build an image and you just say, well, look, using the same set of parameters, but just fetch uh, from an upstream vendor, for instance, like if you're having an Ubuntu or CentOS image, say, just, just build me the, the new nightly image, uh, and then just you know, upload that to Glance, and that way that becomes available uh, for use. And that way you can kind of keep on top of you know, getting updates from vendors without actually having to do any work. It's the, the, the cheap way. Um, for all new VMs, you get the latest um, updates. Um, then, then we want to do uh, vulnerability and compliance scans for the image, and I'll, I'll talk about uh, that later. Uh, so that's part of the, the, the pipeline. Uh, you also can do um, 
uh, regression testing. So part of, part of this pipeline is that an image is not actually made available until it's passed a num number of stages. You've, it's, it's passed regression testing so you can see, well, does it boot? Can you log in the, the, the basics? And then you can extend that and saying, well, there may be other things. You say, well, there's, there's a whole set of demons that may be in the image. Can I check that they're all up and running correctly? Um, then you also have the, the compliance tests and the vulnerability scans. So basically, these are all gatekeeping points. And a, an image is not actually available for use until they've passed all those points. You can define policies on exactly how, um, you know, at, to what level uh, an image has to sort of pass this level of goodness before you make it available to people. Um, uh, then we can uh, publish images and actually control the publication so that uh, we can use that for essentially deployment because you, you don't want to have an event where you, you push an image, it, it passes your test, okay, but then the, there's some danger lurking in the image um, or some, just, some fatal bug that just wasn't caught during testing, and that you know, I think you all know that testing doesn't ca catch all the bugs. Uh, and then you make that available globally in, in your entire fleet. And then you have some other event that causes a, a widespread number of VMs to restart. They'll restart with a new image, and well, basically, you know, you're out of luck. Uh, so then you want to have uh, you want to tie the the publication into uh, canaries and different zones, so you can control how quickly this thing may get out if if you have like a like a fleet-wide VM restart or something like that. Um, then, so setting up this workflow sort of hides a lot of that work from people. Um, so then we, we use this for building our images, and then we can make this available as a service for our customers within Symantec to say, okay, if, if you want to build an image, you can use all these technologies and then get all these you know, good things for free. So what do we do for our, um, our image qualification? So we, we run Qualys. Um, so that basically looks for known vulnerabilities. It, essentially, it's a, a large database check. Um, and we also run an internal uh, compliance suite to see, basically, have you hardened this image? Um, in many cases, just like, is, is it sufficiently annoying that it's, it's, you know, it's past what we think is you know, you know, a, a well-hardened image? Um, we think it's going to be secure. So um, again, these, uh, these tests then sort of say, with, with the, the, the policies that you can define, you can say, okay, only after it's passed, you know, uh, maybe it's like you know, at least 80% secure, because you don't actually get perfect security, but at least you have, you, know, you say, we think there's no critical security vulnerabilities, there's only like you know, low risk vulnerabilities, so this is good enough to, uh, to be published. And so you can define that uh, in your policies and then make that available. And similarly for um, the compliance scans as well as you know, regression testing. Um, and so the, cl clearly you would not want to um, publish an image as public until it's you know, passed um, all these tests. So another thing you need to do is you have to continuously rescan all the images because just because an image was published two weeks ago and it was great then, right now that same image, that same set of bits, uh, the new vulnerability has been discovered. And it's like, oh, okay, we need to uh, patch that. So we need to, we need to know there's a problem. So we need to always be rescanning our entire repository of images that um, are made available, which is another reason why you have to do cleanup because otherwise you just have an ever-growing list of images to scan and it can take a while to scan. So um, once you find there's a critical vulnerability, then you mark the image as, as being vulnerable, and then you have to start setting out uh, notifications to people. Um, you can present in the user interface um, the state of every image, so you can say what it's you know, basically you know, red, green, yellow, um, whatever you use for you know, defining how good an image is. Um, and then um, anyone who, both the image owner and anyone who has running a, a VM that uses that image needs to be notified that there may be a potential problem. Uh, because you're doing scans and because the whole uh, image building pipeline is fully automated and is actually run by a service account, uh, you can attach to the metadata for the images links to the vulnerability scans for that image. So if you need to drill down, like, just how bad is this image? You get the, you get the email, you know that you're using this image. Well, how bad is it really for me? And then you can go look and say, okay, maybe it's not a problem. Um, or maybe I can live with it just a, you know, a couple more days. Um, and so we can have a, you know, we, we can summarize all the results and include those. Um, and you, you then we run audits on that. Um, we basically define an SLA, and uh, you've also talked about that. Um, essentially, it's, you, know, um, you, you have a certain amount of time uh, to fix 
fix an image that's deemed to be uh, critically vulnerable. Uh, and so then we have a, a set of steps about who gets notified, image owners, you know, VM owners. Um, they get emails, they get nag mails, and so if you kind of escalate to a certain point, and then at, at some point the hammer comes down and the images just get disabled. Um, at, at the end of the day, we, we reserve the right to you know, disable an image and disable VMs, which we deem may be a risk to the whole uh, cloud. Um, for configuration management, um, we basically have two flavors. Uh, we have the uh, base image, uh, which just works out of the box. I mean, it, it boots up, networking works, you can log in, um, user accounts are set up like through LDAP, and then that's it, you're on your own for that image. You manage it yourself, you update packages. So that's great for people who kind of want to do it themselves. Then we have another flavor image, which are the opinionated images, where they're, they're images that we actually use uh, for our own platform services. So if we have you know, load balancing services or database services, um, then we need images to run those VMs, and th those, these are the images we use. And these, these are at the moment controlled by Puppet, um, and so we, you know, we have a whole list of packages that we think that this is, this is what you need, a whole set of configuration, and that might not work for some of our customers. So they have the choice. They can go bare bones, base, and do it themselves, or they can take our images, and we support both. Uh, and then through the community image uh, feature, people can take base images and extend them, and if they decide to take up the the maintenance burden, the support role um, of you know, helping their sort of fellow employees, then they can do that as well. And that's basically it. Questions? We have a little bit of time for questions. Um, if you find an image is vulnerable... Speak into the If your scan finds that an image is vulnerable and someone has a VM running off that image and they've already patched their own VM, are they still subject to having their VM taken down? So that's a good question and we didn't cover that, but um, sort of implicit is that not just do we have to scan images, but we also have to start scanning VMs. Uh, we're not at that point yet, uh, it, and it's more expensive. Uh, but yes, we'll have to do that and we'll have a, a similar sort of process. Um, it really, it doesn't make any difference whether um, it's the image that's vulnerable and then, or, or some particular VM that's sort of drifted away from uh, you know, what, what's patched and good. So yes, at some point we'll have to take those, uh, those ones down uh -huh. with, with notification. It's interesting because typically what you find is that the VMs are patched first. Because you find the critical vulnerability, you go and patch the VMs. It's quite frequently that the images are being forgotten in that process. And you end up with uh, every single VM in the environment is patched, and you have a lot of images that are sitting there not patched, and uh, you spin up new VM and you get uh, back the vulnerability that you thought that you fixed already. So that's why we're kind of more focused on getting the images right. So uh, for private image, unless they subscribe to your full service, how do you actually know they are vulnerable or not? We, we scan the images. You're, for private images you're re referring right, to. Right, yeah. for private. So even for private image, you also scan them? Because I saw that it's the image's owner's responsibility for these images. Uh, so th while they're responsible for um, the content of the images, um, to actually publish an image, even for themselves, it requires going through our pipeline. And the pipeline runs all the checks. So for instance, they couldn't publish an image that didn't pass the basic regression test. If it didn't boot, they wouldn't be able to upload that to Glance because they don't have direct access to uploading. It's, that's done through the service account that provides all the gatekeeping roles. Does that make sense? Hi. Uh, you mentioned Puppet at the end there. Um, can you say a little bit more about how you've set up Puppet? Do you have one per tenant, or is it managed by the cloud services team? It's in flux, actually. Um, <laughs> we have one sort of Puppet-based module that we're using for all our machines, and we're actually, um, there's a colleague here who's 
offered uh, very graciously to uh, redo all that. Um, so we're kind of learning just what's the best way of using Puppet. Um, and it's even possible we might not be using Puppet in the longer term. Um, in, in a previous life, um, I, I was using a system that actually pushed images, not sort of puppets, like, and it actually worked very, very well. Um, so I'm kind of biased towards that. I have another question. Um, do you have any particular tool recommendations, um, in particular for image building and or image testing? Uh, not, not the vulnerability one, uh, the yeah. functional testing. Yes, um, so for image building, at the moment we're using Packer. Um, Actually, I'm not too fond of that either. Um, I, just, I just recently joined, and sort of I'm sort of inheriting a bunch of things. <laughs> um, well, it, it's just really slow. Um, it's like even to build a basic image, it's like five minutes or something like that on a VM. And you know, I, just, I can do that in the 30 seconds with like um, Deb Bootstrap, for instance. Uh, and it's essentially the same operation. It's just you're not spinning up a VM and you're not like emulating a human, pushing buttons on an ISO install, installation CD and all that kind of stuff. I can understand why they've done it, but um, I'm really hoping that we can find better ways of doing that. Um, so, but that's currently the tool we're using, is Packer. But that's just, as far as I'm concerned, that's just a plug-in. Um, the, we, I'll, I'll be happy to rip that out and put something else that's much faster. Uh, and you had another question too, I think, um, about testing, oh, yes. Um, so that's likely to be, at this stage, um, a framework that we'll write um, with plugins. Um, basically, it's a, a, a framework that you can say, okay, look, here I've got an image. I need to you know, run it through some kind of testing air or scanning regime. So you know, automatically spin up VMs, provide plugins, so they can put in regression testing modules. Um, a bunch of those we'll be writing ourselves and then also plug into our scanning um, services because it's, most of it's the same problem, right? It's like, I've got an image, I need to put it into a VM and explore it in various ways. Thank you. Right. How do I lower this? I think you usually kind of uh, unscrew yeah. um, something there and it slides down. Or you can pull them out, oh, Mike. That's better. That's better. Thank you. Um, first of all, I mean, thank you very much. You know, very informative session. I appreciate it. I had a question about auditing and compliance, and if you can expand more about you know your experience with auditing, and I'd be particularly interested if you were subject to any sort of you know compliance standard, um, and if you can talk more about it, and also you know if uh, did you find what was your experience? Did the OpenStack services uh, log enough events that would help you from an auditing perspective, or what are some of the you know use cases you ran into? That'd be great. On the auditing, uh, we absolutely are in scope for various compliance uh, regulations, and our. Uh, friends at uh, the uh, Semantic Global Security Office provide us with all of the requirements that need to be met, including the tools that need to be run as part of the scanning in order for us to meet the audit requirements. Now, we also uh, find that uh, the default logs that uh, OpenStack components produce are not sufficient in order to meet compliance requirements. However, with uh, the PyCAD, uh, or rather now it's Keystone middleware, uh, audit middleware that we have enabled on our services, that produces the events that we can collect and store for the audit trail necessary for compliance needs. Okay, thank you. <coughs> uh, had a question regarding licensing of the software that's in the images. So what happens if, what's stopping somebody from putting copyrighted material in an image and making it community? And, and also then though in a, in a good use of this, what, do we ha what, what does the semantic cloud have for kind of um, charging so that if you have licensed software being distributed in your image, is there a way that you can be charging so that the owners of that license are getting their, their, their money for the instance hours based on that image? Very good question. Today we don't charge our users for pretty much anything. It's private cloud. Uh, however, it's a very good question that we need to start thinking about, uh, about licensed uh, software. 
uh, we do have uh, internal process at Symantec uh, about uh, controlling what software can and cannot be used, both commercial as well as open source. And we have uh, the uh, service team, the teams who actually work on building the products within the Symantec, uh, kind of need to make sure that they don't use anything that is not allowed. But it's a, one of the services that we probably need to start uh, thinking about also. 